Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have a terrific show today, a reading from the Victorian poets. This is Bob Beecher's idea. He has chosen a superb group of poems. Tony Sawyer is unable to be with us today. We miss her. The magnificent readers in order of appearance are Bob Beecher, Corinne Conley, Helen Richman, Kay Wiseman, me, Harry Northup, and Garen Berry. Here's Bob Beecher. Thank you, Harry. We're starting with the Lotus Eaters, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Courage, he said, and pointed toward the land. This mounting wave will roll us shoreward soon. In the afternoon they came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon. All round the coast the languid air did swoon, breathing like one that hath a weary dream. Full faced above the valley stood the moon, and like a downward smoke, the slender stream along the hit cliff to fall and pause and fall did seem. A land of streams, some like a downward smoke, slow dropping veils of thinnest lawn did go, and some through wavering lights and shadows broke, rolling a slumberous sheet of foam below. They saw the gleaming river seaward flow from the inner land. Far off, three mountaintops, three silent pinnacles of aged snow, stood sunset flushed and dewed with showery drops, up clomb the shadowy pine above the woven cups. The charmed sunset lingered lower down in the red west. Through mountain clefts, the dale was seen far inland and the yellow dam bordered with palm, and many a winding vale and meadow set with slender galingale, a land where all things seem the same, always seem the same, and round about the keel with faces pale, dark faces pale against that rosy flame, the mild-eyed melancholy of lotus eaters came. Branches they bore of that enchanted stem, laden with flower and fruit, whereof they gave to each. But whoso did receive of them and taste, to him the gushing of the wave, far, far away did seem to mourn and rave on alien shores. And if his fellows spake, his voice was thin as voices from the grave. And deep asleep he seemed, yet all awake and music in his ears his beating heart did make. They sat them down upon the yellow sand between the sun and moon upon the shore. And sweet it was to dream of fatherland, of child and wife and slave. But evermore most weary seemed the sea, weary the oar, weary the wandering fields of barren farm. Then someone said, we will return no more. And all at once they sang, our island home is far beyond the wave. We will no longer roam. Ulysses, Alfred Lord Tennyson. It little profits that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags Matched with an aged wife, I meet and dull unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the leaves. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone on shores and when through scudding drifts the raining Hyades Vex the dim sea, I am become a name. For always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known. Cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honored of them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met. Yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. 
how dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe were life. Life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me, little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things. And vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself, and this gray spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, my own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfill this labor by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centered in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness, and pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. He works his work, I mine. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail. There gloom the dark, broad seas. My mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads. You and I are old. Old age hath yet his honor and his toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. The long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to sink a new, seek a newer world. Push off and sitting well in order, smite the sounding pharaohs. For my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the Western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. The Charge of the Light Brigade, Lord Tennyson. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the 600, forward the Light Brigade. Charge for the guns, he said, into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the Light Brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew, someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to wonder why, reason why, theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the 600. Flashed all their sabers bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabering the gunners there, charging an army, while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke. Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not not the 600. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon behind them volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell, they that had fought so well came through the jaws of death back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of 600. When can their glory fade? 
Oh, the wild charge they made, all the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the Light Brigade, Noble 600. The Song of the Shirt by Thomas Hood. With fingers weary and worn, with eyelids heavy and red, a woman sat in unwomanly ways, plying her needle and thread. Stitch, 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 in poverty, hunger, and dirt, and still with a voice of dolorous pitch, she sang the song of the shirt. Work, 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 while the cock is crowing aloof, and work, 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 till the stars shine through the roof. It's oh to be a slave, along with the barbarous Turk, where a woman has never a soul to save, if this is Christian work. Work, 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 till the brain begins to swim. Work, 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 till the eyes are heavy and dim. Seam and gusset and band, band and gusset and seam, till over the buttons I fall asleep and sew them on in a dream. O oh, men with sisters dear, O oh, men with mothers and wives, it is not linen you're wearing out, but human creatures' lives. Stitch, 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 in poverty, hunger, thirst. Sewing at once with a double thread, a shroud as well as a shirt. But why do I talk of death? That phantom of grisly bone, I hardly fear his terrible shape. It seems so like my own. It seems so like my own. Because of the fasts I keep. Oh God, that bread should be so dear and flesh and blood so cheap. Work, work, work. My labor never flags, and what are its wages? A bed of straw, a crust of bread, and rags. That shattered roof and this naked floor, a table, a broken chair, and a wall so blank, my shadow I thank for sometimes falling there. Work, work, work. From weary chime to chime, work, 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 as prisoners work for crime. Band and gusset and seam, seam and gusset and band, till the heart is sick and the brain benumbed as well as the weary hand. Work, 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 in the dull December light, and work, 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 when the weather is warm and bright, while underneath the eaves the brooding swallows cling, as if to show me their sunny backs and twit me with the spring. Oh, but to breathe the breath of the cowslip and the primrose sweet, with the sky over my head and the grass beneath my feet. For only one short hour, to feel as I used to feel before I knew the woes of want and the walk that costs a meal. Oh, but for one short hour, a respite however brief, no blessed leisure for love or hope, but only time for grief. A little weeping would ease my heart, but in their briny bed, my tears must stop for every drop hinders needle and thread. Seam and gusset and band, band and gusset and seam. Work, 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 like the engine that works by steam. A mere machine of iron and wood that toils for mammon's sake, without a brain to ponder and craze, or a heart to feel and break. 
with fingers weary and worn, with eyelids heavy and red, a woman sat in unwomanly rags, plying her needle and thread. Stitch, 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 in poverty, hunger, and dirt, and still with a voice of Dolores pitch, would that its tone could reach the rich. She sang this song of the shirt. How Pleasant to Know Mr. Lear by Edward Lear. How pleasant to know Mr. Lear, who has written such volumes of stuff. Some think him ill-tempered and queer, but a few think him pleasant enough. His mind is concrete and fastidious. His nose is remarkably big. His visage is more or less hideous. His beard, it resembles a wig. He has ears and two eyes and ten fingers, leastways if you reckon two thumbs. Long ago, he was one of the singers, but now he is one of the dumbs. He sits in a beautiful parlor with hundreds of books on the wall. He drinks a great deal of marsala, but never gets tipsy at all. He has many friends, laymen and clerical, Old Foss is the name of his cat. His body is perfectly spherical. He weareth a runcible hat. When he walks in waterproof white, the children run after him so, calling out, he's come out in his nightgown, that crazy old Englishman, oh. He weeps by the side of the ocean. He weeps on the top of the hill. He purchases pancakes and lotion and chocolate shrimps from the mill. He reads, but he cannot speak Spanish. He cannot abide ginger beer. Ere the days of his pilgrimage vanish. How pleasant to know Mr. Lear. My last Duchess by Robert Browning. Carrara. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will it please you to sit and look at her? I said, Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I. And seemed as though they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Sir, t'was not for husband's presence only. Call that spot of joy into the duchess's cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. Or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, it was all one. My favor at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with around the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush, at least. She thanked men, good, 
but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling, even had you skill of speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one and say, just this or that in you disgusts me. Here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth, and made excuse, e'en then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew. I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will please you rise? We'll meet the company below, then. I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his fair daughter self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a, a rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. The bishop orders his tomb at St. Praxed's Church by Robert Browning, Rome 15. Vanity, saith the preacher, vanity. Draw round my bed. Is Anselm keeping back? Nephews, sons mine. Ah, God, I know not. Well, she men would have to be your mother once. Old Gandalf envied me, so fair she was. What's done is done, and she is dead beside, dead long ago. And I am bishop since, and as she died, we must die ourselves. And thence ye, ye may perceive the world's a dream. Life. How and what is it, as here I lie in this state chamber, dying by degrees, hours and long hours in the dead night, I ask, do I live? Am I dead? Peace, peace seems all. St. Proxids ever was the church for peace, and so about this tomb of mine. I fought with tooth and nail to save my niche, you know. Oh, Gandalf cousined me despite my care. Shrewd was that snatch from out the corner south he graced his carry-on with. God curse the same. Yet still my niche is not so cramped, but thence one sees the pulpit or the epistle side and somewhat of the choir, those silent seats, and up into the airy dome where live the angels and the sunbeams sure to lurk. And I shall fill my slab of basalt there and neath my tabernacle take my rest with those nine columns round me, two and two, the odd one at my feet where Anselm stands, peach blossom marble all, the rare, the ripe as fresh poured red wine of a mighty pulse. Old Gandalf with his paltry onion stone, put me where I may look at him. True peach, rosy and flawless, how I earn the prize. Draw close. That conflagration of my church. What then? So much was saved 
if aught were missed. My sons, ye who would not be my dust, go dig the white grape vineyard where the oil press stood. Drop water gently till the surface sink, and if ye find, oh, God, I know not. I bedded in store of rotten fig leaves soft and corded up in a tight olive frail some lump. Ah, God, of love is a lazuli, big as a Jew's head cut off at the nape, blue as a vein o'er the Madonna's breast. Sons, all I have I bequeath you, villas all. That green frost villa with its bath, so let the blue lump poise between my knees. Like God the Father's globe on both his hands, ye worship in the Jesu church so gay. For Gandalf shall not choose, but see and burst. Swift as a weaver's shuttle fleet our years. Man goeth to the grave, and where is he? Did I say basalt for my slab, sons? Black, was ever antique black I meant. How else shall he contrast my frieze to come beneath? The bar relief in bronze ye promise me. Those pans and nymphs ye wot of, and perchance some tripod, thyrsus with a vase or so. The Savior at his sermon on the mount, St. Praxed in a glory, and one pan ready to twitch the nymph's last garment off. And Moses with the tables. But I know he mock me not. What do they whisper thee? Child of my bowels, Anselm, ah, ye hope to revel down my villas while I gasp, bricked or with beggar's moldy travertine, which Gandalf from his tomb top chuckles at. Nay, boys, ye love me. All of Jasper, then. Tis Jasper ye stand pledged to, lest I grieve my bath must needs be left behind, alas. One block, pure green as a pistachio nut. There's plenty jasper somewhere in the world. And have I not St. Praxed's ear to pray horses for ye and brown Greek manuscripts and mistresses with great smooth marbly limbs? That's if ye carve my epitaph aright. Choice Latin, picked phrase, tullies every word. No gaudy wear like Gandalf's second line. Tully, my masters, Ulpian serves his need. And then how I shall lie through centuries and hear the blessed mutter of the mass and see God made and eaten all day long and feel the steady candle flame and taste good, strong, thick, stupefying incest smoke for as I lie here, hours of the dead night dying in state, and by such slow degrees, I fold my arms as if they clasped a crook, and stretch my feet forth straight as stone can point, and let the bedclothes for a mort cloth drop into great laps and folds of sculptor's work. And as young tapers dwindle and strange thoughts grow with a certain humming in my ears about the life before I lived this life and this life too, popes, cardinals, and priests, St. Praxed at his Sermon on the Mount, your tall, pale mother with her talking eyes and newfound agate urns as fresh as day, and marbles of language, Latin pure, discreet, and Elushashabata, quoth our friend. No, Tully, said I, Ulpion at the best. Evil and brief hath been my pilgrimage. All lapis, all sons, else I give the Pope my villas. 
Will you ever eat my heart? If ever your eyes were as a lizard's, quick, they glitter like your mother's for my soul. Or ye would heighten my impoverished trees, piece out its starved design and fill my vase with grapes and add a visor and a term and add to the tripod ye would tie a lynx that in his struggle throws the thyrsus down to comfort me on my entablature. Where am I am to lie till I must ask, do I live? Am I dead? There, leave me there, for ye have stabbed me with ingratitude to death. Ye wish it. God, ye wish it. Stone grips on a crumble, clammy squares, which sweat as if the corpse they were keeping were oozing through, and no more loppies to delight the world. Well, go. I bless ye. Fewer tapers there. In a row, and going, turn your backs, I like departing altar ministrants, and leave me in my church, the church for peace, that I may watch at leisure if he leers, old Gandalf at me from his onion stone, as still he envied me, so fair she was. Sonnets from the Portuguese. Sonnet 14, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. If you must love me, let it be for naught except for love's sake only. Do not say I love her for her smile, her look, her way of speaking gently, for a trick of thought that falls in well with mine and certes brought a sense of pleasant ease in such a day. For these things in themselves, beloved, may be changed or changed for thee. And love so wrought may be unwrought so. Neither love me for thine own dear pities wiping my cheeks dry. A creature might forget to weep who bore thy comfort long and lose thy love thereby. But love me for love's sake, that evermore thou mayest love on through love's eternity. Sonnet 35. If I leave all for thee, wilt thou exchange and be all to me? Shall I never miss home talk and blessing? and the common kiss that comes to each in turn, nor count it strange when I look up to drop on a new range of walls and floors, another home than this. Nay, wilt thou fill that place by me which is filled by dead eyes too tender to no change? That's hardest. If to conquer love has tried to conquer grief, tries more, as all things prove, for grief indeed is love, and grief beside, alas, I have grieved, so I am hard to love. Yet, love me, wilt thou, Open thine heart wide and fold within the wet wings of thy dove. Remembrance by Emily Bronte. Cold in the earth and the deep snow piled above thee, far, far removed. Cold in the dreary grave. Have I forgot my only love to love thee? Severed at last by time's all severing wave. Now, when alone, 
do my thoughts no longer hover over the mountains on that northern shore, resting their wings, where heath and fern leaves cover thy noble heart forever, evermore. Cold in the earth, and 15 wild Decembers from those brown hills have melted into spring. Faithful indeed is the spirit that remembers after such years of change and suffering. Sweet love of youth, forgive if I forget thee, while the world's tide is bearing me along. Other desires and other hopes beset me, hopes which obscure but cannot do thee wrong. No later light has lightened up my heaven. No second morn has ever shone for me. All my life's bliss from thee, dear life, was given. All my life's bliss is in the grave with thee. And when the golden dreams have perished, and even despair was powerless to destroy, then did I learn how existence could be cherished, strengthened, and fed without the aid of joy. Then did I check the tears of useless passion, weaned my young soul from yearning after thine, sternly denied its burning wish to hasten down to that tomb already more than mine. And even yet, I dare not let it languish, dare not indulge in memory's rapturous pain. Once drinking deep of that divinest anguish, how could I seek the empty world again? Hope by Emily Bronte. Hope was but a timid friend. She sat without the grated den, watching how my fate would tend, even as selfish hearted men. She was cruel in her fear. Through the bars one dreary day, I looked out to see her there, and she turned her face away. Like a false guard, false watch keeping, still in strife, she whispered peace. She would sing while I was weeping. If I listened, she would cease. False she was and unrelenting when my last joy strewed the ground. Even sorrow saw repenting those sad relics scattered round. Hope, whose whisper would have given balm to all my frenzied pain, stretched her wings and soared to heaven, went and ne'er returned again. The Old Stoic by Emily Bronte. Riches I hold in light esteem, and love I laugh to scorn, and lust of fame was but a dream that vanished with the morn. And if I pray, the only prayer that moves my lips for me is leave the heart that now I bear and give me liberty. Yes, as my swift days near their goal, tis all that I implore in life and death, a chainless soul with courage to endure. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. The sea is calm tonight, the tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits, on the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon bleached land. Listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling. At their return up the high strand, 
begin and cease, and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find it also in the sound of thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy nor love nor light, nor certitude nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. The Forsaken Merman by Matthew Arnold. Come, dear children, let us away, down and away below. Now, my brothers, call from the bay. Now the great winds shorewards blow. Now the salt tides seawards flow. Now the wild white horses play, champ and chafe and toss in the spray. Children, dear, let us away. This way, this way. Call her once before you go. Call once yet in a voice that she will know. Margaret, Margaret. Children's voices should be dear. Call once more to a mother's ear. Children's voices wild with pain. Surely she will come again. Call her once and come away. This way, this way. Mother dear, we cannot stay. The wild white horses foam and fret. Margaret, Margaret. Come, dear children, come away down. Call no more. One last look at the white walled town and the little gray church on the windy shore. Then come down. She will not come though. You call all day, come away, come away. Children dear, was it yesterday we heard the sweet bells over the bay in the caverns where we lay? Through the surf and through the swell, the far off sound of a silver bell? Sand strewn caverns, cool and deep, where the white Winds are all asleep, where the spent lights quiver and gleam, where the salt weed all sways in the stream, where the sea beast ranged all round, feed in the ooze of their pasture ground, where the sea snakes coil and twine, dry their mail and bask in the brine, where great whales come sailing by, Sail and sail with unshut eye round the world forever. And I, when did music come this way? Children dear, was it yesterday? Children dear, was it yesterday? Call yet once that she went away. Once she sat with you and me on a red gold throne in the heart of the sea. And the youngest sat on her knee. She combed its bright hair and she tended it well. When down swung the sound of the far off bell. She sighed. She looked up through the clear green sea. She said, I must go for my kinsfolk pray in the little gray church on the shore today. It will be Easter time in the world. 
Ah, me, and I lose my poor soul, Merman, here with thee. I said, go up, dear heart, through the waves, say thy prayer, and come back to the kind sea caves. She smiled. She went up through the surf in the bay. Children, dear, was it yesterday? Children, dear, were we long alone? The sea grows stormy, the little ones moan. Long prayers, I said. In the world, they say. Come, I said, and we rose to the surf in the bay. We went up the beach by the sandy down where the sea stops bloom to the white walled town. Through the narrow paved streets where all was still to the little gray church on the windy hill. From the church came a murmur of folk at their prayers. But we stood without in the cold blowing airs. We climbed on the graves, on the stones worn with rains, and we gazed up the aisle through the small leaded panes. She sat by the pillar. We saw her clear. Margaret, hist, come quick. We are here. Dear heart, I said, we are long alone. The sea grows stormy, the little ones moan. But ah, she gave me never a look, for her eyes were sealed to the holy book. Loud prays the priest, shut stands the door. Come away, children, call no more. Come away, come down, call no more. Down, down, down. Down to the depths of the sea, she sits at her wheel in the humming town, singing most joyfully. Hark what she sings. Oh, joy, oh, joy, for the humming street and the child with its toy, for the priest and the bell and the holy well, for the wheel where I spun and the blessed light of the sun. And so she sings her fill, singing most joyfully, till the shuttle falls from her hand and the whizzing wheel stands still. She steals to the window and looks at the sand and over the sand at the sea. And her eyes are set in a stare and anon there breaks a sigh and anon there drops a tear. From a sorrow clouded eye and a heart sorrow laden, a long, long sigh. With the cold, strange eyes of a little mermaiden and the gleam of her golden hair. Come away, away, children, come, children, come down. The hoarse wind blows colder, lights shine in the town. She will start from her slumber when gusts shake the door. She will hear the winds howling. She will hear the waves roar. We shall see while above us the waves roar and whirl, a ceiling of amber, a pavement of pearl, singing, here came a mortal, but faithless was she, and alone dwell forever the kings of the sea. But children, at midnight, when soft the winds blow, when clear falls the moonlight, when spring tides are low, when sweet airs come seaward from heath starred with broom, and high rocks throw mildly on the blanched sands a gloom. Up the sill, glistening beaches, up the creeks we will hie, over banks of bright seaweed, the ebb tide leaves dry. We will gaze from the sand hills at the white sleeping town, at the church on the hillside, and then come back down, singing, There dwells a loved one, but cruel is she. She left lonely forever the king's of the sea. 
The Choice by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. One, eat thou and drink, tomorrow thou shalt die. Surely the earth, that's wise being very old, needs not our help. Then loose me, love, and hold thy sultry hair up from my face, that I may pour for thee this golden wine, brim high, till round the glass thy fingers glow like gold. We'll drown all hours, thy song, while hours are told, shall leap as fountains veil the changing sky. Now kiss, and think that there are really those, my own high bosom beauty, who increase vain gold, vain lore, and yet might choose our way. Though many years they toil, then on a day they die not, for their life was death, but cease, and round their narrow lips the mold falls close. Two, watch thou and fear, tomorrow thou shalt die, or art thou sure thou shalt have time for death? Is not the day to which God's word promiseth to come man knows not when? In yonder sky, now while we speak, the sun speeds forth. Can I or thou assume him of his goal? God's breath, even at this moment, haply quickeneth the air to a flame, till spirits always nigh, though screened and hid, shall walk the daylight here. And dost thou prate of all that men shall do? Canst thou, who hast but plagues, presume to be glad in his gladness that comes after thee? Will his strength sly thy worm in hell? Go to, cover thy countenance, and watch, and fear. Three, think thou and act, tomorrow thou shalt die. Outstretched in the sun's warmth upon the shore, thou sayest, man's measured path is all gone o'er. Up all his years steeply with strain and sigh, man clomb until he touched the truth. And I, even I, I am him, I am whom, even I am I whom it was destined for. How should this be? Art thou then so much more than they who sowed that thou shouldest reap thereby? Nay, come up hither from this wave-washed mound unto the furthest flood brim, look with me, then reach on with thy thought till it be drowned, miles and miles distant though the last line be, and though thy soul sail leagues and leagues beyond, still leagues beyond those leagues, there is more sea. A Triad by Christina Rossetti. Three sang of love together, one with lips, crimson with cheeks and bosom in a glow, flushed to the yellow hair and fingertips, and one there sang who soft and smooth as snow, bloomed like a tinted hyacinth at a show. And one was blue with famine after blue, who like a harp string snapped rang harsh and low, the burden of what those were singing of. One shamed herself in love, one temperately grew gross in soulless love, a sluggish wife, one famished died for love. Thus, two of three, took death for love, and won him after strife. One droned in sweetness like a fattened bee, all on the threshold, yet all short of life. Okay. After Death by Christina Rossetti. The curtains were half drawn, the floor was swept, and strewn with rushes, rosemary and may, lay thick upon the bed on which I lay where through the lattice ivy shadows crept. He leaned above me, thinking that I slept and could not hear him, but I heard him say, poor child, poor child. And as he turned away, came a deep silence, and I knew he wept. He did not touch the shroud or raise the fold that hid my face or take my hand in his or ruffle the smooth pillows for my head. He did not love me living, but once dead, he pitied me, and very sweet it is to know he is still warm, though I am cold. No, thank you, John. 
by Christina Rossetti. I never said I loved you, John. Why will you tease me day by day and wax a weariness to think upon with always do and pray? You know I never loved you, John. No fault of mine made me your toast. Why will you haunt me with a face as wan as shows an our old ghost? I dare say Meg or Moll would take pity upon you, if you'd ask. And pray don't remain single for my sake, who can't perform that task. I have no heart? Perhaps I have not. But then you're mad to take offense that I don't give you what I have not got. Use your own common sense. Let bygones be bygones. Don't call me false, who owed not to be true. I'd rather answer no to 50 Johns than answer yes to you. Let's mar our pleasant days no more. Songbirds of passage, <coughs> days of youth. Catch at today, forget the days before. I'll wink at your untruth. Let us strike hands as hearty friends, no more, no less, and friendship's good. Only don't keep in view ulterior ends and points not understood in open treaty. Rise above quibbles and shuffling off and on. Here's friendship for you, if you like. Uh, but love? No. Thank you, John. <laughs> the Jabberwocky, written by Charles Dodson under the pen name of Lewis Carroll. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the burrow groves, and the momraths outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jujube bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time the maxim foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the Jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came whiffling through the tolgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Well, come to my arms, my beamish boy. Oh, fabulous day, Kalu Calais, he chortled in his joy. It was brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the burrow groves, and the momraths outgrave. The Walrus and the Carpenter. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright. And this was odd, because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because well, she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The sea was wet as wet could be. The sands were dry as dry. You could not see a cloud because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead, or well, there were no birds to fly. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. Oh, they wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If, all, if this were only cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose, the walrus said, that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. Oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. Uh, we cannot do with more than four uh, uh, to give a hand to each. 
The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. Uh, the eldest oyster winked his eye and shook, shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Well, their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was very odd, because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four, and thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock conveniently low, and all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. But wait a bit, the oysters cried, before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath, and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need, Pepper and vinegar, besides, are very good indeed. Now, if you are ready, oysters dear, we can begin to feed. But not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. Uh, after such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so kind of you to come, and you are so very nice. The carpenter said nothing but, cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf. I've had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, to play them such a trick. After we've brought them out so far and made them trot so quick. The carpenter said nothing but, the butter's spread too thick. <laughs> I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathize with sobs and tears. Uh, he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter, you've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came there none. And this was scarcely odd because they'd eaten every one. God's Grandeur by Gerard Manley Hopkins. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook oil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, Nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights of the black west went, oh, morning, at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, oh, Bright wings. Gangadin by Rudyard Kipling. Uh, you may talk of gin and beer when you're quartered safe out here and you're sent to penny fights and aldershot. But when it comes to slaughter, you will do your work on water and you lick the blooming boots of him who's got it. Now in Inge's sunny clime, where I used to spend my time, a servant of Her Majesty the Queen, uh, of all them black-faced crew, 
the finest man I knew was our regimental beastie, Gunga Dean. He was Dean, 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 you limpin' lump of brick dust, Gunga Dean. Hi, slippery hitherow, water get it, tanny low, you squidgy nosed old idol, Gunga Dean. The uniform he wore was nothing much before and rather less than half of that behind. For a piece of twisty rag and a goatskin water bag was all the field equipment he could find. When the sweatin' troop train lay uh, sidin' through the day, where the eat would make your bloomin' eyebrows crawl, we shouted, Ari, bye, till our throats were bricky dry. Then we whopped him, cause he couldn't serve us all. It was Dean, 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 you Ethan, where the mischief have you been? You put some duty in it or I'll marry you this minute if you don't fill up my helmet, Gunga Dean. He wouldn't dot and carry one till the longest day was done. And he didn't seem to know the use of fear. If we charged or broke or cut, well, you could ble- bet your blooming nut he'd be waiting 50 paces right, for right flank rear. With his music on his back, he would skip with our attack and watch us till the bugles made retire. And for all his dirty eyed, he was white, clear white inside when he went to tend the wounded under fire. It was Dean, 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 with the bullets kicking dust spots on the green. When the cartridges ran out, you could hear the front files shout, Hi, ammunition mules and Gunga Dean. I shan't forget the night when I dropped behind the fight with a bullet where my belt plate should have been. I was choking mad with thirst, and the man that spied me first was our good old grinning, grunting Gunga Dean. He lifted up my head and he plugged me where I bled. And he gave me arf a pint of water green. Oh, it was crawling and it stunk. But of all the drinks I've drunk, I'm gratefulest to one from Gunga Dean. It was Dean, Dean, Dean. Here's a beggar with a bullet through his spleen. He's chawing up the ground and he's kicking all around. For God's sake, get the water, Gunga Dean. He carried me away to where a dooley lay. And a bullet come and drilled the beggar clean. He put me safe inside. And just before he died, I hope you liked your drink, says Gunga Dean. So I'll meet him later on at the place where he is gone, where it's always double drill and no canteen. <laughs> He'll be squatting on the coals, giving drink to poor damned souls. And I'll take a swig in hell from Gunga Dean. Yes, Dean. Dean, Dean, you Lazaruthian leather Gunga Dean. Though I've belted you and flayed you by the living God that made you, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Dean. Thank you very much, Garen, Bob, Corinne, Helen, Kay. What a marvelous reading. You know, there's uh, the Industrial Revolution happening at this time, the work, 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 the religion, then the religion uh, receding the melancholy for that, the resoluteness of the people, the nonsense, leer. You know, this is really a a complicated, dualistic society. And as you all know, the Victorian era was like 1837 to 1901 when Victoria, when she was on the throne. Let's start with Bob Beecher, whose idea it was, and then go in the, uh, the, the chronology that we all followed. Corinne after that, Helen, you know, Kay, myself. And Garen, Bob Beecher, please. Very briefly, Harry, uh, the readings were beautiful. Thank you all for uh, bringing to life this uh, magnificent poetry of the Victorian period. Um, I'd like to keep it in a historical perspective. We had the romantics, and I think we see how the subject, to Harry's point, how the subject matter, the themes are changing as the Industrial Revolution and the world is changing. And then, you know, very briefly after the death of Victoria becomes the Edwardian period. And uh, all of this poetry is being written in the shadow of World War I. 
uh, and the enormous fragmentation of of the world. So thank you all for this this beautiful reading. Corinne? Well, uh, I was kind of overwhelmed by all the titles of poems that I felt I should know and probably have studied and what have you. Uh, the Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, when Bob was reading it, I kept thinking, what 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 historical event was this? It was all in my mind. I think of, I saw movies of it. Uh, uh, but and then I have to say, Garen, uh, uh, I was in tears at the end of Gunga Din. I've heard Gung, we all know Gunga Din, but uh, he's a better man than I am. But I don't think it's, it, I just guess I never heard it throughout, and I got really with it, and I have tears in my eyes for Gunga Din. That was a, a beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Me too. <laughs> yeah. I had a real hard time getting to the end. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So. Ellen. Am I next? Ellen. Yes. Okay. Um, Robert Browning, the, uh, the dramatic monologue that he writes, um, it came because um, he was uh, writing plays and they were not successful, but he obviously. Uh, was uh, wanting to express himself through characters. And sure enough, as he went into the dramatic monologues, he would express through the character and the dialogue um, um, the, the um, essence of the character. And, uh, it, uh, and, he, and the character would reveal itself to the listener. So uh, it was an amazing thing that as a poet, he was writing these dramatic monologues. And of course, it was wonderful to be able to read uh, um, like an actor uh, because it's, it is, it's is—it's like a play. So um, bless him, is a wonderful um, medium in which he was uh, expressing himself. Okay. Well, uh, as I have said before, um, I learn every time uh, I do these things and I listen to everybody else. I'm so uh, touched by everyone's reading and their knowledge. And uh, all the time I was playing my castanets, this was going on. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to catch up <laughs> and I'm just enjoying uh, myself every time I get through a poem. Garen, we have about a half a minute or so. Well, I, I found most of the poetry a little difficult to understand to my taste. I was very happy to read the two Lewis Carroll poems, because even though he was a, a very religious man and a deacon of the church, he expressed himself in a heathen way that very much appeals to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the Gunga Dean poem, I, I had never read it completely before, and it just killed me the way he talks about, you know, the, the black bastards and then, you know, how he was white as white could be because he gave me water. I mean, it was just uh, completely uh, uh, difficult for me to get to the end on that one. Thank you, Garen, and here's Jennifer Clymer, and thank you, Bob, for this marvelous set of poems that you chose. Jennifer? Uh, thank you all again. Thank you. thank you, Jen. Harry, thank you so much for, for everything you do in the world of poetry.